throughout the history, cavalry has been one of the most effective tactics on the battlefield. Militaries used horses and chariots to attack the opponent, which has been replaced by the armored vehicles. But with the gradual decline of mounted cavalry, armored vehicles were developed to do the task of cavalry units. Even after the invention of the tank, armored vehicles were and still aren't ideal to be replaced because of their operation, development and maintenance cost and higher speeds. In World War II, most armored cars were engineered for specific roles like reconnaissance and patrolling, and making changes in an automobile was relatively easier than in track vehicles. Some armored cars equipped with heavier armament could even be replaced for track combat vehicles in favorable conditions, such as the pursuit of flanking maneuvers during the North African campaign of World War II. After the success of these vehicles, engineers tried to put cannons on them. Unfortunately, the recoil of the cannons was so high that it almost flipped or damaged their chassis. But after the post-war advances in recoil control technology of World War II, engineers were able to put cannons on some of these highly engineered armored cars. Welcome to another episode. This is Faz and in this video, we are going to talk about the armored vehicles. What were the factors that make them better and the current combat armored vehicles? So. Let's get back to the 15th century when the first armored wagon failed the advances of the knights. The very first war wagons were used by the Hussites, a Czech proto-Protestant Christian movement. They covered their wagons with steel plates and were crewed by men, armed with primitive hand cannons, flails and muskets. During the enemy attack, their horses and oxen were in the middle and they chained the wagons in a circular motion. This formation of wagons provided protection from the armored-wearing knights. Impressed by these wagons, the English and Chinese empires began using similar wagons in their army. By the end of the 17th century, the steam engine was invented by Thomas Savory. However, it wasn't made to be used in automobiles at that time, but to pump water out of the flooded mines. But it's the nature of an inventor to try out new things. And inventors from Victoria did exactly that. They designed prototypes for steam engine powered armored vehicles for use in sages. Although none of them were able to deploy in an actual combat because of their practicality. A short story by H.G. Wells, The Land Ironclads, provides a fictionalized version for their use. In the 18th century, France was the dominant power in Europe. But because of the defeats in the War of Spanish Succession, the French economy started to decline. In the north, for much of the first half of the century, British faced Jacobite rebellion, but it didn't stop the British Empire to expand. The 18th century saw a considerable British imperial expansion. At the same time, Russia was emerging as a modern military power, changing the balance of power in Europe. On the other side of the globe, America went revolutionary and started a war with Britain and won it as well. After the settlement, where both countries realized that their previous territorial map was garbage. Later, both parties agreed to redraw the borders and they did. Unfortunately, these islands were left and nobody cared about them. Until this general and some crazy farmers almost started a war over the killing of a pig. Yeah, they did that. Luckily, when the officials found out about it, they handled the situation and the island went to America. Back in the Europe, revolution was coming to hit the door once again. The American ideals of liberty, democracy, acted as a fuel to the financial mismanagement of France, which in the end threw France into the revolutionary turmoil from 1789. And by 1793, France was at war with basically most of the Europe. Although because of the battle strategies of its generals, France came on top. In the end, there wasn't much development in the automobile sector or in the battle reforms in the century. But you know, when I was researching and studying the 19th century, I was stunned. It was a complete chaos. There were a total of 36 wars fought. And if I summarize the events of this time period, then Napoleon was the star of the early 19th century. Britain, on the other hand, focused their attention on its empire, fighting rebellion campaigns in India during 1840s and 50s, and more or less continued minor campaigns in Africa as well. And I also found out that the time period from 1848 to 71, other European powers saw a major revision of the map, when much of Europe was enveloped by the French Revolution. Prussian Empire took advantage of this situation. It first obtained dominance in Germany, and then used that dominance to crush the second empire, France. On the other side of the globe, America was occupied by the civil war to demolish slavery. It was in this century when the major battle reforms happened. 
The first reform was the breech loading, followed by repeating firearms, rifled artillery, the first machine guns, trench warfare, barbed wire, and primitive land and sea mines. The invention of the steam engine and iron revolutionized naval warfare as well as automotive industry. It was the beginning of a new era that would completely change the battle. So before we go any further, I want to let you guys know that there are three categories for armored vehicles. Light armored cars such as the British Ferret are armed with just a machine gun. Secondly, heavier vehicles are armed with auto cannons or a large caliber gun. And lastly, the heaviest armored cars such as the German World War II era, KFZ-234 or the modern US M1128 mobile gun system. The ending years of 19th century to the beginning of 20th century came with some initial armored car designs, of which two were designed by a British inventor, Frederick Richard. In 1898, Richard designed and built the world's first armed car. It was a quadricycle with a mounted Maxim machine gun on the front and the rider was protected by an iron shield in the front of the car. As it wasn't an armored car, it did not provide any protection to the rider from the sides and the back. It was also not even as much efficient as a horse-driven armament of that era because of the earlier IC engines. The second car story is influenced by the Boer War in South Africa, which was fought between the British Empire and two Boer Republicans over the British Empire's influence in Southern Africa from 1899 to 1902. It was built for the British Army and had a Daimler chassis and motor. Unfortunately, the prototype was finished when the war was over and it didn't get the chance to perform on the battlefield. And lastly, the Panzer Wagon, which was built by Daimler in 1904. And it was used in the Italo Turkish War by the Italians. Wars have always worked as a catalyst for the technologies to grow. You need new and improved weapons to win, and they can only come with the technological advancements. This is exactly what the World War I gave to humanity, but also casualties and losses that were more than the wars of the 19th century combined. It was a war to end all wars, although this was not the outcome. With the tensions rising in Europe in the early 20th century, World War I began with the assassination of Archduke France. For the first time in history, countries around the globe fought together. In the early stages of war, armored vehicles were used for very specific tasks, mostly used by commanders. But because of the industrial and technological advancements, air power started to pose a bigger threat. To counter it, militaries developed armored vehicles that could carry heavier cannons and anti-aircraft guns. While in the UK, armored cars were used by the British Royal Navy, where the Royal Navy dispatched aircraft to Dunkirk in the hope to defend UK from Zeppelin airships. The cars followed the aircraft and began to rescue the downed pilots in the battle. They also started to put more armor on their cars, which were provided by a local shipbuilding house, as the exertions became more dangerous. Armored cars also saw action on the Eastern Front. From February to the March of 1915, as the German's army under the control of General Galwitz attempted to break through the Russian lines in and around the town of Pratznitz in Poland. However, near the end of the battle, the Russians used four Russia Bold and Menesman's Molag armored cars to break through the German lines and force the Germans to retreat. By the end of World War I, millions of lives were lost. But if we look at the positives, the technology had grown to an unimaginable scale. Pilotless drones, aircraft carriers, air traffic control and tanks are some of the major technological outcomes of World War I. It is not accurate to say that the World War I was a cause of World War II, but it is accepted that the punishments of the Treaty of Versailles for the Germany contributed to the cause of it. Germany was shocked by how strict the treaty was. It was humiliating and many people wanted revenge. The same kind of situation went for Italy. Although Italy was on the winner's side in World War I, but what it got from it wasn't enough and Italy felt betrayed. On top of all, the economy was suffering and people were furious. In the East, Japan had already invaded China for the natural resources that Japan didn't have, making Germany and Italy become allies with Japan. At a time when these countries were politically unstable and extremely poor, it was a perfect climate for Hitler and Mussolini to rise to power by telling the Germans and Italians what they wanted to hear and making big promises to them. World War II began when the Germany and USSR invaded Poland after the invasion of Austria and Czechoslovakia by Germany. The aftermath of World War II was the beginning of a new era for all the countries involved. 
defined by the decline of all European colonial empires and the simultaneous rise of two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. On the side of the technological advancements, radars, computers, antibiotics and atomic bombs are the most recognized inventions of World War II. The technology continued to improve throughout the 19th century and the space race between the USSR and the US pushed communication and rocket technology further. On the other hand, the defeat of the Vietnam War made the US realize that it was difficult or nearly a suicide to move soldiers through the jungles and swamps because of the geography of Vietnam. The enemy used jungles as a decoy and it was turned into a guerrilla warfare. Surprisingly, the timeline of the space war and the Vietnam War is the same, 1955 to 75. It might be a coincidence, but for the US, it was kind of a two completely different situation in which the US was competing. As the war was getting longer and more expensive, the US Army decided to pull out of Vietnam. The US may have lost the Vietnam War, but by putting the first human on the moon, the US won the space race and the achievements of the Soviet Union were lost. By the late 80s, the US had developed its technologies because of the space race and used them to introduce the Humvee to its army in 1883, followed by many tactical armored and operation vehicles. It was a major upgrade from the previous World War II era jeeps, increasing its vehicle class from 37 to 106 vehicles. In the upcoming conflicts, Humvee proved to be one of the most successful vehicles of all time and was used in Iraq, Gulf, Afghanistan, Syria and Bosnian wars. Even after the US pull out from Afghanistan, the Taliban is still using the Humvee. Unfortunately, as we entered the late 19th century, the Soviet Union and the US made a series of blunders in Afghanistan, which became one of the reasons of the collapse of USSR and the economic downturn of the United States. 2001 The United States with its allies invaded Afghanistan and toppled the Taliban government. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The invasion's aims was to destroy Al-Qaeda, which had executed September 11 attacks. The United Kingdom was a key ally of the United States, offering support for military action from the start of preparation for the invasion. It followed the Afghan civil war phase between the Taliban and the Northern Alliance groups, which resulted in the Taliban controlling 90% of the country by 2001. The invasion became the first phase of a 20-year-long war in the country and marked the beginning of the US war on terror. Between 2003 and 2016, the US unloaded hundreds of thousands of rifles, machine guns and more than 22,000 Humvees. You may think, why 22,000 Humvees? It's because of the geography of Afghanistan is some of the harshest in the world and this amount of vehicle was absolutely necessary to move the soldiers whenever needed. However, in the early years of the war, Humvee became absolutely useless. The reason was the IEDs. IEDs have killed more than 21,000 civilians and 3,100 plus soldiers in Afghanistan and about 75% of casualties in combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan are caused by IEDs every single year. Soldiers were dying more by the IEDs than in combats. The Department of Defense came up with an idea to save the lives of the soldiers through the MRAP vehicle program, a program to make mine-resistant vehicles and deploy them in Afghanistan. And to date, more than 15,000 MRAP vehicles have been made and about 6,000 have been already fielded. The best part about it is that these vehicles have saved more than 40,000 lives from mines and IED explosions. I want to ask you something. What are some features that you would like to add in an armored car? Some of you might say that it should be stylish or good looking. Some of you might say that it should be fuel efficient. But on the battlefield, these factors won't do any good to protect the soldiers. Although design is a major factor, but it's not the whole story. Now let's explore the present day military vehicles and what makes them better than the previous ones. Remember the US lost both in Afghanistan and Vietnam. A similar situation in the current time period would be the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, where the tanks and heavy vehicles of the Russian convoy got stuck in the mud. Locals call this mud Rasputitsa. This mud gets formed naturally in winters every year. There was one thing that was common in these different situations, topography. In Vietnam, it was the forest and jungles. 
in afghanistan it was the desert mountains and those caves and in ukraine it was the mud whenever this type of situation comes it becomes a tough challenge for the soldiers and the equipment to move geologists call it ecosphere our military could easily avoid these challenges by logistics but no one cares these days whenever a company builds an equipment or a vehicle they always take the ecosphere into consideration the boundaries of a military ecosphere could be physical barriers like ocean or mountain ranges they might also be changes in the topography these combination of terrain vegetation and artificial features can easily make an equipment or a tech effective or ineffective just like this 2 billion dollar worth of b2 bomber aircraft that crashed because one of its electronics caught moisture present in the air at the night this is the reason why modern armored vehicles are built taking these factors into consideration because a technical failure on the battlefield can take the lives of the soldiers all right remember the mrap vehicle program that program also had orders to replace humvee with a better vehicle that could not only protect soldiers from bullets but from blast as well The answer was the JLTV or Joint Light Tactical Vehicle. Early studies for the JLTV program were approved in 2006, almost after a decade of development by the defense companies in the US. Oshkosh was selected for the production in August 2015. The JLTV is a new class of light tactical vehicle for the US Army. It has a 6.5 liter V8 turbocharged diesel engine that can take the vehicle up to 70 miles an hour or 112 kilometers an hour. The thing that makes GLTV better is its tech. Intelligent independent suspension system, all-terrain capabilities, Cougar and BAE systems and the electric monitoring system. The biggest advantage of the GLTV is its blast resistance. Besides GLTV, present time militaries around the world have all kinds of mission driven vehicles from escorting to support missions. They can be used in defense or in offense, and some of these vehicles are even amphibious. So how modern vehicles are able to provide protection from even blasts let's find out the easiest answer would be that the militaries have a huge budget to spend on r&d we should not forget that the united states has the biggest military budget they spend around 100 billion dollars on just research and development and after the russia and china having the hypersonic missile edge over the us this budget will go up to 112 billion dollars another reason would be the engineering of these vehicles let's dig in After the IEDs, Soviet era AK-47 is the biggest threat to the lives of the soldiers. This rifle has more firepower than the current air rifles. Deaths caused by the AK-47 is more than 250,000 a year, and this number makes the casualties of the atomic bombs look tiny. Now the challenge is, how do you make an armor that could stop AK round and blasts, but also doesn't weigh too much? The problem with armors is that they're extremely heavy. Take hardened steel for example, which is commonly used in armored vehicles. It does provide protection, but its protection is directly dependent on its weight. The more steel you add, it will give you more protection, but the consequences is weight. This creates a domino effect where the vehicle suspension and engine would also need an upgrade, so the performance of the vehicle won't get compromised, which comes with more weight as well. So is there a solution? Absolutely there is. Composites. They are a breakthrough in material sciences and have been in the use for around 3400 BC. Carbon fiber nylon and peak are a great example of composites. Modern armored vehicles, sports car chassis and the Turkish drone Bayraktar, which is currently being used in the Russia and Ukraine war, are also made from carbon fiber. In simple words, a composite is made from two or more different materials, but the final product will have the properties of all the initial materials. This is a great solution as it allows our scientists to make stuff that is cheaper yet stronger. Weight saving is one of the core advantages of composites. It directly improves fuel efficiency, performance and increases payload. Composites also have a greater fatigue life. Some of you may think what's fatigue life? Fatigue life simply means how long does a material can last under stress. Aluminum has the least fatigue life, steel has higher and composite have the highest. Scientists also add Kevlar to these composites to improve their strength. Kevlar is a heat resistant and strong synthetic fiber. A bullet can be stopped by Kevlar if its layers are stacked upon each other. It was developed by Stephanie Kolek in 1965. Until the invention of Kevlar, there were no bulletproof vests or helmets. But the invention of Kevlar would change everything in the upcoming years. Kevlar was first used commercially in the early 70s as a replacement for steel wires in Formula 1 racing tires. 
although it wasn't until the mid 70s that the US began making helmets and vests with Kevlar and Kevlar is also used to make vehicle armor. The other piece of armor protection is the bulletproof glass but it took a lot of time to be used in vehicles. Its story begins in 1903 with an incident. A French chemist Edward Benedictus dropped a glass beaker on the floor but the glass didn't shatter. There was liquid nitrate in the glass which made a thin plastic layer that prevented the glass from shattering. After some experiments, he was successful in making laminated glass which he later patented in 1903. Laminated glass was used in World War 1 for military vehicles, aircrafts and even gas masks. Although laminated glass was invented in the early 20th century, it wasn't until 80s that the first patent for ballistic glass was granted. Modern bulletproof glass uses various materials to stop bullets such as polycarbonate layers and acrylic. The only factor to notice here is that they are stacked in sheets as a single sheet of glass can stop a bullet. But combining layers of glass helps to add additional strength as the glass can take multiple bullet hits at a single point before the bullet can pierce it. The final piece of puzzle is technology. Modern technology is as new as 20th century but it was used even in ancient times. According to the scriptures and writings, fortification, siege towers, chariots, castle, trebuchet and Greek fire are as old as 1600 BC. But the thing that really ignited the use of firepower was the invention of gunpowder in China around 142 AD, which led to the invention of modern artillery and weapons. There wasn't much of a difference in military technology until the 19th century, and military technology can be divided into five categories. offensive and defensive weapons sensor guided weaponry transportation technology and communication coordinate in the 19th and 20th century the dependency on technology increased significantly more particularly in aircrafts although in vehicles it wasn't used until the introduction of humvee in the early 80s but even in afghanistan humvee only had communication technology on the other hand The modern armored vehicles are on a different scale. They can attack the enemy with remote controlled light cannons, perform supplies and reconnaissance missions, and can provide protection in defensive measures as well. Who knows what happens tomorrow? Maybe humanoid robots that may fight in the war for us, or it could be camouflage vehicles. Humans have a tendency to evolve, and as we do, we affect our surroundings, which could be negative or positive. In the end with the technology and computational power that we currently have let's hope that the things will be positive. So that's the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you do want to watch more of these videos please make sure to subscribe to this channel because as you all know this is a new channel I have just uploaded this video. So it would be really really helpful if you just just hit that subscribe button please. And also check out the links below and I'll catch you in my next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.